has a few things to say to author Michael Wolff about the president he knows. But first... It has been determined that there is no collusion and by virtually everybody. So we'll see what happens. So that is how the president responded when asked if he will be personally interviewed by Robert Mueller. Before we get to the vice president, chief national correspondent Ed Henry starts us off in the White House tonight. Ed. Martha, great to see you. This is all about President Trump trying finally to kick off the new year by going on offense over these various Russia investigations, basically fed up with playing defense for so long uh, throughout the last year. The president, one day after his personal attorney, Michael Cohn, tweeted, enough is enough, and filed defamation suits against BuzzFeed plus Fusion GPS and its co-founder, Glenn Simpson, over what Cohn called the phony dossier. The president, starting today by tweeting about Democrat Dianne Feinstein, leaking that transcript of Simpson's testimony, declaring, quote, the fact that sneaky Dianne Feinstein, who has on numerous occasions stated that collusion between Trump and Russia has not been found, would release testimony in such an underhanded and possibly illegal way, totally without authorization, is a disgrace, must have tough primary, meaning back in California. Then the president used a joint news conference with the prime minister of Norway to reiterate his claim that the U.S looks bad on the world stage because of all of these various probes uh, into Russia, including special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. The president hedging on a one-on-one -on -one with Mueller by saying when there's no collusion, it's unlikely there would be an interview at all, suggesting Hillary Clinton was treated with kid gloves by the FBI when she was interviewed over her email server. There is collusion, but it's really with the Democrats and the Russians far more than it is with the Republicans and the Russians. So the witch hunt continues. I will say this. I am for massive oil and gas and everything else and a lot of energy. Putin can't love that. I am for the strongest military that the United States ever had. Putin can't love that. Then there's immigration. Democrat Steny Hoyer emerging today from yet another leadership meeting to say he wants a deal on DACA and then border security can come later. Well, the president was aggressive about trying to clarify what he said yesterday, making clear there's no DACA deal in his estimation without funding for the wall. No. 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 It's got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. Uh, I would imagine that the people in the room, both Democrat and Republican, uh, I really believe they're going to come up with a solution to the DACA problem, which has been going on for a long time, and maybe beyond that immigration as a whole. But then Senator Elizabeth Warren was just on with Brett a few moments ago, suggesting Democrats may even be willing to shut down the government to get a DACA-only deal and block the president's wall. This is a battle royal that's coming, Martha. It certainly is. Ed, thank you very much. So the vice president is about to embark on a major mission to the Middle East, and then he will head the U.S. delegation to the Olympics in South Korea. But we started with just this subject, the hot battle over the wall and what the president promised. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for making some time for us today. Good thank to you, speak Martha. With you. Uh, obviously, one of the biggest stories right now is DACA. The San Francisco judge made a ruling saying that right. essentially uh, that the president had no rights over what comes next with DACA, that it has to stay in place. What's your reaction to that? Well, we believe that uh, we believe that decision was wrong, wrongly decided. Uh, once again, another another West Coast uh, judge has rendered a decision that uh, if, if would go to the Supreme Court, we're sure would be overturned. Even even President Obama said on multiple occasions that he did not have the authority uh, through executive action uh, to extend protection through DACA. And uh, President Trump last year made it clear that we're going to stand by the Constitution. Congress writes the laws, the president implements and upholds and executes the laws, and we're confident the Supreme Court would uphold that. But our, our hope is, as you saw yesterday, is to continue a dialogue with Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill and call on the Congress to come together to address issues of border security, to make the necessary changes, mm -hmm. chain migration, visa lottery, and also deal with the DACA issue with the compassion. But you're you're right in the middle of that discussion, as we saw yesterday, a very active debate at the table, fascinating for everybody, I think, in America to watch. Yeah. Um, but what does this do to your leverage when in the middle of that moment, this judge says basically that issue's off the table? Well, we, we really don't think it affects it in any way because we, we, we believe that ultimately this, this decision has to be made 
by the Congress of the United States and that the Supreme Court of the United States would uphold that. Clearly, under our Constitution, the Congress writes the laws. Uh, the president executes them and implements them and upholds them, and we're confident the court would do that. I, I, honestly, I think that, that the leadership that President Trump is providing on this issue uh, is making it possible for us to move forward on priorities the president's expressed since the days of the campaign. Look, the American people want us to build a wall. They want border security. They want to end the flow of illegal immigrants into this country and also illicit drugs that are tearing apart families and communities all across this country. They also, in, in the wake of those terrorist attacks in this country recently, they want us to end the visa lottery program. They want us to, to reform and end chain migration in this country. And ultimately, I think the American people also want us to deal compassionately with the issue of DACA. What, what the American people saw yesterday is, frankly, what I see every day as his vice president in one meeting after another is President Trump bringing together uh, people from diverse points of view, driving toward an objective, and we're confident. We're confident that uh, even before the president's deadline of March is reached that uh, we'll be able to achieve an outcome that will do credit like to all those priorities. Two, excuse me, um, two elements of yesterday. One was exactly what you say. In the wake of the Michael Wolff book, which portrayed the president as someone who is unfit for office, he clearly demonstrated the command that he has of, of the issues and the negotiating ability that he has sitting at that table. And I think it went a long way towards dispelling some of those notions yesterday. On the other side, some of the president's biggest supporters when it comes to immigration, uh, initially during the campaign, for sure, Ann Coulter, uh, Tucker Carlson on, on our own network, were really uh, felt very betrayed by what the president said at that table yesterday, that, that he sort of gave away the farm on the issue, that he said, just bring me something, bring me whatever you want and I'll sign it. Um, I will offer a pathway to citizenship. They felt that the issue of the wall and, and creating a border that is impenetrable and sending people back who are here illegally was, was swept away with that discussion yesterday. Well, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. And the president made that clear a little later in the day, uh, that, uh, that this president, this administration, are absolutely committed to keep the promises we made to the American people. I mean, as the president said last weekend at Camp David, uh, th there's no DACA fix without a wall. We're going to build a wall. Or we're going to end chain migration. Or we're going to end the visa lottery program. Uh, and we're going to deal with DACA, but we're going to do it in a way that, that will meet the expectation of the American people. I, I have to tell you that what the American people saw yesterday is something that, you know, I, as I said before, I, I see every day. As vice president, I spend three or four hours a day with the president, oftentimes in the Oval Office and in meetings near the Oval Office. And, and I'm absolutely confident on this issue and on, on a broad range of issues, whether it be infrastructure, rebuilding our military, that this president is going to continue to bring that great leadership quality that he has to bear, leadership that has resulted in a growing economy and restored American credibility in the world. And we're going to solve this issue and keep America moving forward. I, I just want to go back one more time on the leverage issue, though, because you know, Diane, Diane Feinstein, Senator Feinstein, yesterday at the table said, let's just do a clean bill on continuing the government, continuing yeah. resolution. It ends January 19th. Let's just get that done. And we'll deal with DACA later. Is that the way the White House sees it at this point, given this ruling? No, the president believes that it's absolutely essential that we resolve all of the issues that were outlined in the meeting yesterday together, that we, we come to an agreement to build a wall, to keep that promise to the American people, that we come to an agreement to, to end the visa lottery program and chain migration, and that we also deal compassionately with the All of that as part of the funding the bill the by January program. 19. Well, no, well let, let me be clear on that. Okay. We, we believe that the negotiations that are underway, resulting in the wall and DACA and, and the changes in immigration reform, will come later. I think what, uh, I think what, uh, what we believe is going to be possible is as we make progress in reaching a bipartisan solution on these immigration issues, that that's going to facilitate us making the kind of uh, funding uh, agreement possible in the Congress to move forward. It's absolutely essential that Congress step up, pass a spending bill to rebuild our military at the level that President Trump has been driving. Look, we have many challenges across the wider world. I'll be traveling to the Middle East in the coming weeks. I'll be traveling to, to the Olympics in South Korea next month. I mean, now is the time, as we started last year, to make a historic investment in our military, and President Trump is absolutely committed 
to reaching a bipartisan agreement to pass that spending right, so bill, even sounds, while we work through these other understood. issues on immigration. So it sounds like what you're saying is that at the, for the 19th, yeah, thank you. defense spending has to be in that CR. Is that correct? We, we, That's non-negotiable. Presidents made it absolutely clear that after years where the sequestration has resulted in, um, in, in frankly, unacceptable budget cuts in our military, yeah. that we have to reach an agreement on what's called budget caps, that we have to make a historic investment in our military. It's going to take some negotiation on some other domestic you need spending. Democrat votes on board it to is, get this but, passed. But we really they're going believe... to want parity on things like opioids. And, and, and well, is that and this, okay? is, this is a president who's made it very clear. He's, he's deeply concerned about the opioid crisis facing communities and families across this country. We're prepared to support that. We're prepared to support more funding for veterans' issues. The president signed another bill yesterday to expanding mental health benefits to our veterans. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but we believe we can reach an agreement on the spending bill. It will likely be facilitated by the progress that we're making on the immigration issue, but we'll get the spending bill done in time for the American people and in time to make the investment in the military that we need to make. And no DACA, no continuation of DACA without a wall? I think the president's been very clear. There's no deal on DACA without a wall. Without a physical wall. And not only, not only without a wall, Martha, but also without ending the visa lottery program and ending the kind of chain migration mm -hmm. that has resulted in people coming into this country that have done harm to Americans in recent months. We've got to make these changes. The American people want to see it happen. As I traveled across this country, not only over the last year, but during the course of the campaign, I heard from one American after another that the flow of illegal immigration, the flow of illicit drugs is tearing apart families and communities has got to end. And border security and a wall are central to that. And President Trump's going to accomplish it. And you think you can get the 60 votes needed to do that? Uh, we're, we're cautiously optimistic that he can. But, but make no mistake about it. There will be no deal on DACA unless there's funding for a wall and funding for the kind of changes in immigration that will put the safety and security of the American people first. Hmm. All right. So next, Vice President Pence digs into the fight over moving our embassy to Jerusalem. Also, his honest take on what he really expects to happen in the midterms. Stick around for that. Uh, also, the president gets some pushback on the border and the wall. Big, big topic this today. It was the lowest day of his presidency. Lindsey Graham joins me next. He's got something to say to Ann Coulter after this. I feel having the Democrats in with us is absolutely vital because this should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. President Trump promising a bill of love during his extraordinary bipartisan immigration meeting. Some conservatives, though, slammed it as, quote, a DACA love fest. But others, like Senator Lindsey Graham, were all aboard the love train. I don't know if the Republican and Democratic Party can define love, but I think what we can do is do what the American people want us to do. Moments ago, I spoke to Senator Lindsey Graham about that. A lot of talk about love in that meeting yesterday, <laughs> and I know that you felt that it was an extraordinary meeting, which I think I a lot of us it. who watched it thought it was pretty incredible in, in a number a of ways. Uh, you once should do it once a week, right? Uh, let, me, let me play for you what uh, some of the critics had to say, and, and I want to okay. hear your thoughts. Go ahead. I think Donald Trump got his gang of eight tattoo tonight <laughs> and, uh, and, and, the, and the members only jacket for rhino cuck immigration squishes because this wow. is a guy who literally sat there today and shredded the entire Bannon Steve Miller agenda. When Kevin McCarthy is the hardliner on immigration in the room, I think we can call this the lowest day in the Trump presidency. Those folks are not too happy, Senator Graham. <laughs> well, that's okay. Uh, those folks don't have to solve problems. The president does. He's got to work for, with Democrats to fix problems like immigration. They don't. They're pretty much outliers when it comes to where the American people are. 62% of the Trump voters support a pathway to citizenship for the DREAM Act kids if you secure the border. We're not going to have a deal without a wall component. You need a wall component. I think the president did a fabulous job of talking about this problem. He did it uh, in a smart way, in a compassionate way. And, uh, you know, uh, his job is not to, to sell books. His job is not to carry a TV show. His job is to solve problems, and he's got to work with Democrats. And I was proud of my president yesterday.
I, I mean, I think everybody who listens to you can completely understand the task that you all have at hand. Um, right. And I think whenever anyone runs for president, they tend to run, you know, sort of with, with a stronger stance on certain issues. And then when they hit the reality of getting things done, um, right. as this president seems to want to do, it changes a bit. But it's very interesting when you look back at some of the rhetoric from the campaign. Uh, Jeb Bush was the one who talked about <laughs> it being an act of love, and he was he was lambasted by the president. Watch yeah. what was posted by the Trump campaign during the campaign. Yes, they broke the law, but it's not a felony. It's kind of the it's it's a it's a it's a it's an act of love. Green has said, "Love, forget love. It is time to get tough." So, so has the president given away too much already in this negotiation? And where is this whole thing headed? I think it's. I hope it's headed to phase one, where we get border security. Uh, for uh, the DREAM Act, uh, the DACA kids having a pathway to citizenship, that we end the diversity lottery like the president uh, claims uh, demands, and he's right to demand it, that we start breaking chain migration, that we get a deal that represents where the American people are. Eighty-three percent of the American people support a pathway to citizenship. Overwhelming numbers support uh, border security. I think most people think the, the diversity lottery is kind of crazy. This president is no longer a candidate. He's the president of all of us. You can't get this problem fixed without working with Democrats. You need 60 votes. And what I saw yesterday was a man who understood the issue, was in command of the room, listened intently, is going to take this country to a solution. For 10 years, I've been working on this. Obama tried it, couldn't do it. Bush tried it, couldn't do it. Donald Trump will be the president that can do it. He's got credibility on the border security issue that nobody else has. He does have compassion in his heart for these kids. We're going to get a good deal under his leadership. And the difference between being a radio talk show host and a TV personality and president is that as president, you've got to solve problems. Let me ask you before I let you go, when is it going to happen? You know, when is that going to happen? Is it going to be part of this continuing resolution? Is, is any of it going to be part of that? Or is that going to be a clean bill that gets passed right. on the 19th? I talked to the vice president about this this right. morning. Um, or is it, and, and then it comes later. How do you see it right now? Right. If it doesn't happen in January, I'm not so sure it's ever going to happen. Mm. Uh, both sides can say no to each other, but we've been doing that for 10 years. We've got a, a moment in time here to have a breakthrough on immigration that makes sense, border security for the DACA kids and some other things, entering, ending the diversity lottery. But it will break through in terms of uh, military spending increases. If we can get an agreement on immigration, then we can start to rebuild our military in a bipartisan fashion. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot of lives going to be affected by what we do. We've got a chance here to fix a problem on immigration and rebuild our military. And I'm urging the president to continue what you did yesterday, lead this nation, challenge Democrats to meet you in the middle, and uh, get this thing done. Mr. President, you're the right guy at the right time. You can do it. Nobody else has been able to do it, and I want to help you. It sounds like you and the White House are on different pages in terms of timing. Uh, so that, that, that's something that's going to have to be resolved. Um, yeah, that's and right. we'll stick around for the next chapter on that. Senator Graham, always good to talk to you, sir. Thank you so much for being on the story tonight. Thank you. So Diane Feinstein says that she is not alone, but in an illustrious company of those given nicknames by this president. He responded to her move releasing the closed-door testimony of the head of Fusion GPS this way. The fact that sneaky Diane Feinstein, who has on numerous occasions stated that collusion between Trump and Russia has not been found, would release testimony in such an underhanded and possibly illegal way today without authorization is a disgrace. Must have tough primary, he writes. Here now, Alan Dershowitz, Harvard Law Professor Emeritus. Uh, Alan, good to see you tonight. Um, was it sneaky of Dianne Feinstein to do that? Or in your mind, was she in the right? Well, she did it openly. You know, many years ago, I represented Senator Mike Gravel when he released the Pentagon Papers as a member of the Senate. That's the job of senators and, and congressmen. There's nothing sneaky about it. There's certainly nothing illegal about it. Now, you can question whether a minority member of a committee without authorization from the majority should appropriately do it. That's an issue for the committee to resolve. It's an issue for the Senate to resolve. But under our separation of power system, it's really not an issue for the president of the United States to declare to be either sneaky or criminal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some others on the committee are concerned that it might chill others from coming forward and, and having those kinds of interviews. And, Jared Kushner's one of them. And that's a fair point. 
All right. I, I want to ask you the, uh, about Michael Cohen, uh, President Trump's personal lawyer, who today said enough is enough. He's going to go after BuzzFeed and CNN for releasing the contents of the dossier. Does he have a case? Well, he's going to withdraw the case because the first person that BuzzFeed and CNN will call as a witness at the deposition will be President Trump. <laughs> And they'll ask President Trump under oath about the dossier. And that's the last thing a lawyer wants to get his client in trouble over. So I'm not sure whether Cohen got the authorization of his client, the president, to file this lawsuit. The lawsuit will, in the end, I believe, be withdrawn because I don't think that Cohen's going to want to allow the critical witness to this lawsuit, the president of the United States, to sit for hours and hours and perhaps days and days of depositions. Civil lawsuits are two-edged swords. When uh, you bring them, you subject yourself and witnesses to the legal equivalent of a colonoscopy. <laughs> and what about the libel case that the president wants to, he doesn't want to bring a case, but he wants to open up for discussion the libel laws in this country because he feels the subtext in all of this was the Michael Wolff book and he's lashing out against it. Again, it's a two-edged sword, because if he makes libel laws more open-ended, he will be one of the first people to be sued for a defamation for many of the things he said. It sounds to me like this is uh, a bluff. Now, there are changes in the libel laws that should be made. For example, you can say anything about anybody as long as you put it in court papers, and that exempts it from libel. And a lot of uh, unethical people uh, and unethical lawyers uh, do that. They hide uh, defamation in lawsuits, and that should be changed. And there are other improvements that can be made to defamation yeah. laws, but a broad-based change in defamation laws would be inconsistent with the First Amendment. Alan Dershowitz, thank you very much, sir. Always good to see you. Thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you. So there is now some polling available in what a Trump-Oprah matchup would actually look like. Karl Rove has brought numbers to back up his argument. Straight ahead. And also up next, my exclusive interview with Vice President Mike Pence. His new message from the White House for Kim Jong-un is next. The message the president sent me to deliver a year ago is the same that I will deliver when I arrive in Korea again and I visit Japan again. And that is that the era of strategic patience is over. The focus of the world will soon be on the Korean Peninsula as South Korea hosts the Winter Olympics. And for North Korea, that means plenty of propaganda is in the works right now. The North is reportedly planning to send its popular cheer squad to the games, a group of young women, typically about 20 years old, but the description said some of them are younger than that. They have the right ideology, these young ladies, according to the regime. The women are screened to ensure that they will be unlikely to defect or to be affected by other cultures when they travel or, God forbid, to have pro-Japan views in their family. Kim Jong-un's own wife was once a member of that squad. Earlier today, I spoke with the vice president about North Korea and other hot spots in foreign policy. Here's part two of our exclusive interview. In terms of, of South Korea, jumping to the opening of the Olympics, which right. you'll represent the United States uh, and our delegation at, which is very exciting. Um, what do you make of the sort of softening between North Korea and South Korea in their allowing their team, a uh, small team, to participate in the Olympics? What does that signal to you? The president sent me to the region a year ago, and uh, I'll be honored uh, to lead a delegation to the Olympics in South Korea in the, next, in the next month. But the message the president sent me to deliver a year ago is the same that I will deliver when I arrive in Korea again and I visit Japan again, and that is that the era of strategic patience is over for literally two decades, one administration after the other, has exercised uh, uh, a, a level of patience and negotiation that has resulted in uh, the, the uh, dictatorship in North Korea developing ballistic and nuclear missiles that may well threaten the United States of America as we speak. That's unacceptable. President Trump has brought unprecedented economic and diplomatic pressure to bear on the regime in Pyongyang. We'll continue to do that. And part of my message in going is going to be to stand with those American athletes and know that we're cheering them on and wishing them well. But the underlying message is the president is sending us there to make it clear that we stand with South Korea, we stand with our allies in the region, and we will continue to bring maximum economic and diplomatic pressure to bear until North Korea abandons its nuclear and ballistic missile programs that threaten.
threaten the United States of America. In terms of Egypt, which you will also visit, there has been some anger there over the decision to move the capital of, uh, of Israel to Jerusalem. Your meetings were canceled with the Coptic Christian leaders, with Mahmoud Abbas. Can you really move the peace process forward if you can't meet with, with that side of the equation? I'm looking very much forward uh, to meeting uh, with um, President el-Sisi in Egypt, King Abdullah in Jordan, and, uh, and also visiting Israel. I mean, it, it was more than 20 years that one administration after another and one Congress after another recognized that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, but no American president would step forward and make that decision a reality. President Trump had the courage of his convictions to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and it'll be my great honor uh, as vice president uh, to visit and affirm that decision. That being said, the president also, in making that decision, Martha, has said that if the parties can agree on a two-state solution, that we'll support it, that, that the president recommitted the United States to engagement in the peace process. And, and what I'll tell President el-Sisi and King Abdullah and other leaders in the region uh, is that we remain committed uh, to peace. Uh, but what the president did in making that decision and in making it a reality was he essentially took off of the table an issue that really wasn't negotiable to this administration or to the American people. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. The president said that we have recognized the obvious, we have affirmed the will of the American people, but now our hope is that we can move forward and begin to discuss those issues that can be negotiated in the hopes of achieving a lasting so peace. So what concrete steps have been taken so far to actually move the embassy there? Uh, the planning is uh, underway. You know, as, you, as you're well aware, we have a consulate uh, in Jerusalem today, but uh, as the president said, it would be necessary for us to, to make planning, to choose a location, and to develop, it target develop date? the structure. Target date? I think it's, it, it will probably be several years before several years. we cut the ribbon, but uh, the decision is made. We're moving our embassy to the capital of Israel. It would be my great honor uh, to, as vice president uh, in, in to visit of, Israel's capital of later president this month. President Al-Sisi and, and your meeting with him. Mm -hmm. Some feel that we need to push back on that relationship, that presenting it as, as a strong partnership doesn't really tell the whole story, that they have entered into military deals to do reciprocal base agreements with Russia, that they've sided with Russia in the UN when it comes to Syria and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, against our interests. Is that something that you're going to bring up with the president of Egypt? I've had the privilege of meeting President el-Sisi uh, when he visited Washington, D.C., and I'm uh, grateful to have the opportunity to visit with him. I expect we'll talk about a broad range of issues, uh, and, um, um, and I'll be delivering a message of the appreciation that, that President Trump has for the relationship that he's forged with President el-Sisi, but also our desire uh, to see Egypt continue to step forward uh, as a leader in the region, a leader for peace. And also, one of the issues I'll be addressing uh, as well is, is the, the plight that is facing Christian and religious minorities. Egypt has seen in recent days even uh, great violence uh, against Christian churches. And uh, at President Trump's direction last fall, we're reorganizing USAID funding to go directly to Christian NGOs in the region, not only, uh, not only across the Arab world, but specifically in, in areas of Iraq and Syria beset by war. But just to follow up, in terms of, of aid to Egypt and military funding. There's been discussions about cutting that back in the Trump administration. Um, will that be followed through on? And will you essentially say that if there aren't more accessions to human rights standards that we abide by in Egypt, that they would risk losing that military funding? Well, I, I think the, the support that we provide Egypt is a key element of our relationship. But, uh, but you know, Ultimately, my message is going to be, how can we find ways to continue to strengthen the ties between the United States and Egypt and make it possible for us to move forward in a way that advances the security of both of our countries and the security of the region? Okay. Um, it, Congress, just hopping forward to, to your visit to Nevada this week. Um, you'll be there to support Dean Heller. How strong do you see your role in terms of the 2018 elections? A lot of the prognosticators are looking at their models and saying that Republicans are going to have a pretty uphill battle in 2018. 
Well, for the party in power in the White House, history teaches that that first midterm election is always a challenge, but President Trump and I are very optimistic. I mean, think about the progress that we've made in the last year. I mean, this is a president that's rolled back more federal red tape than any president in American history. The appointment of Justice Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, more Court of Appeals justices in a single year than any president in history, historic tax cuts, all of which has created an environment where two million new jobs, unemployment at a 17-year low. You've reflected on African-American unemployment is at a 17-year low as well in this country. We're making tremendous progress, and I think it, it's, it's all a result of the leadership that President Trump has provided, and we think that's a great story to tell, and the President and I are absolutely committed to traveling all across this country, supporting candidates for the House and Senate and governors across the country to make sure that we continue to have partners all across this nation to advance the president's agenda. Well, we look forward to watching all of that. Uh, and good luck on your trip. We wish you the best as you set off for the Middle East and for South Korea in the Olympics as well. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for your time today. Good to thank see you as always. Thank you, Martha. So a world famous actress taking some heat for saying that we're in danger of losing our sexual freedoms and that flirtation and seduction are not crimes. So how far is too far for hashtag me too? And the shows that we grew up with, are they the next to come under scrutiny? Diane. Yes, Sam. It would have bothered me if we had done this. So as Hollywood forges ahead with the Me Too movement, it took a bit of a hit abroad. French film star Catherine Deneuve joined 10, 100 rather, women in an open letter denouncing the movement she thinks has gone too far. She says, in quote, rape is a crime, but insistent or clumsy flirting is not a crime, nor is gallantry a chauvinist aggression. We believe that the freedom to say no to a sexual proposition cannot exist without the freedom to bother. We consider that one must know how to respond to bother, as she puts it, in other ways than by closing ourselves off in the role of prey. Hmm. Very French. Very <laughs> French in so many ways. Katie Pavlich is news editor, news editor at townhall.com and Charlie Hurt, political columnist for The Washington Times. Both are Fox News contributors. Charlie was the only man brave enough to take on this subject. So <laughs> we will start with him. What do you think about the letter? Uh, I think it's uh, I think she makes a really good point, you know, and, and among the problems with uh, what we're seeing today is the whole, you know, lumping in with the very serious things that uh, people have been accused with are all of this this sort of ridiculous, clumsy, ham fisted flirting. There's a big difference between the two. And when you when you lump in the ham fisted flirting with the serious stuff, you cheapen the serious stuff. Yeah. Katie, I mean, you know, there's a lot of pushback to this letter, obviously, um, and it digs into a lot of things about sexual freedoms and what's been fought for and how women, you know, basically you don't want to end flirtation. You don't want to end the art of sedu seduction. Yeah. Um, you know, God forbid the, the well, French would be very upset. The letter was, yeah, the French will be upset, but the letter was actually fascinating and I urge everyone to read it because I think that we do have to look at both sides of this equation here and they make some very uh, sound arguments about what the end, end game would be if we just get rid of any kind of propositioning. And there does have to be a line between sexual assault and catcalling. In France right now, they're deciding that they want to make catcalling a crime with uh, fines for men who happen to do it. And in this letter, they make the point that, look, sex, sex and sexual nature is, is wild and aggressive because we're human beings and that's the way that we're wired. But how we deal with that as a civil society and women standing up for themselves and saying no is the issue. Now, you can't always do that if you're in a situation where Harvey Weinstein is running the whole show and your life depends on getting a job from him. However, the broad brush uh, approach to this that we've gone into of the man hating, all men are wrong, any accusation should be believed without any kind of evidence. That is, I think, what they're pushing back here. Well put. Um, Robert Thompson, the media uh, educator at Syracuse University, said that he, he presented some examples of MASH and Cheers, the one we just showed. Um, and his students, when, he saw, when they saw what happened in these shows, were horrified. Here's two examples. One is Pepe Le Pew, which you probably remember. He's always going after Penelope. And then there is uh, a little clip from It's a Wonderful Life. Watch. <laughs> You are my peanut. I am your brittle. This is a very interesting situation. Please give me my robe. I'll call the police. Well, they're way downtown. They'd be on my side, too. Well, then, then I'm going to scream. 
Maybe I could sell tickets. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, and the mash scene, you know, was a little bit more aggressive. It, you know, the yeah. shower curtain came down on, on Hot Lips Houlihan, as she was called, um, and she was horrified. But they were always giving her a hard time. But Charlie, you know, it's like the students watching this, and they um, they see things very differently than, than we did growing up. And unfortunately, I think uh, a big part of that is the fact that they see everything through sort of a, a legal lens mm. or an HR lens or some mm. sort of, you know, lens that sort of takes away all of the human aspects. So at the end of the day, and we've talked about this before, at the end of the day, it's all about human decency and it's about respecting one another. And if you, if you follow those basic rules uh, about respecting one another, it's going to be fine. It's going to work out just fine. You clear, you, but when the when people clearly go over the line, it's obvious that you go. What Harvey Weinstein did uh, to the potted plant in front of the poor woman that he's with in the in the kitchen, it, you know, that's just unacceptable in any circumstances. Yeah. Pepe Le Pew would never have done that. <laughs> yeah, he's very aggressive though. Katie, what do you think? I just watch those clips and think, thank God I am married because I don't have to deal with the dating world anymore. Because that exa exactly what it reminds me of. But on a more serious note, I don't think you have to look back in time at pop culture in America to see uh, this problem. If you look at recent Hollywood films that are out today, the yeah. objectification of women is mm -hmm. at center in Hollywood now. And until that changes, until sex is not the center of what they do in Hollywood, I just don't see the attitude around using women for that purpose changing either. That's such either. a great point. You know, you think about some of the crude stuff that the kids in that class are probably passing around on their phones right. uh, and thinking nothing of, and they see that and all their alarm bells go off. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Great to see you thank, both tonight. Thanks, thank Charlie you. and Katie, thank you. So the results just came in. We fast forwarding a bit here. Uh, who would triumph if it actually came down to President Donald Trump versus Oprah Winfrey? We will show you the numbers, and Carl Rove has some numbers he wants to crunch on this issue on the whiteboard when we come back. Hey, can, can you beat Oprah, by the way? Thank you. Yeah, I'll beat Oprah. Oprah would be a lot of fun. So if she was a candidate, Oprah Winfrey picking up some steam, according to a new national telephone and online survey never know you know how good these are obviously so we'll show you what the numbers are and you can decide for yourself it shows oprah winfrey with 48 percent donald j trump president of the united states of america at 38 percent and 14 percent undecided which means they could throw that whole thing either way once they made up their minds here now carl rove former deputy chief of staff to president george w bush and a fox news contributor good evening carl we have you um back on whiteboard oprah watch tonight what do you make of those numbers Oh, my God. Are we really doing this? Please. Yes, Thus we far, are. the decline. All right. All right. All right. We'll look at some numbers. We'll look at some numbers. All right. So you're right. Rasmussen, 4838. Don't know how good the poll is. But I do know this. Last March, Quinnipiac said, do you have a favorable, unfavorable opinion of Oprah Winfrey? 52 favorable, 23 unfavorable, 25 didn't know enough to offer an opinion. Do you want her to run for president? 69% said no, 21% said yes. So while they liked her two to one, yep. the object of running for president, there's a, there's a big difference between just sort of being popped into one of these surveys and then yeah, actually do people want you to run. And, and what, look, more important than that, we are three years, just over three years, uh, just under three years away from the presidential election. We are probably a year and a half away from the presidential primary starting to get going. So what is the utility of a poll now doing a matchup for 2020? Does it, how likely is a head-to-head -head matchup going to tell us what, what will happen in three years? I think it's down near... <laughs> Oprah, I mean, zero, zero. Yeah, but that's what I think that's what you said when, when Donald Trump took the ride down the escalator, too, with all due respect. Yeah, uh, maybe too like far five. away. It'll never happen. Well, no, I did. I said it wouldn't happen. I didn't say it's too far away. I said it wouldn't happen. <laughs> um, all right. So, so let's get down to something that, a little more practical and right right in front of us. Um, as you look towards the midterms, the Ohio race is shaping up to maybe be the White House versus uh, Mitch McConnell again, because the White House seems to be. Uh, circling around Jim Renacci, who was going to run for governor and today decided to run for Senate. Then you've got J.D. Vance of Hillbilly Elegy fame, who Mitch McConnell is backing. Your quick thoughts on that before I let you go, sir. Well, I'm not certain. Look, first of all, I like Jim Renacci a lot. I, if you look back in his dark history, guess who was, the, I think, the first person 